नमस्ते एंड वेलकम एवरीवन दिस इज माय नेम इज बिनय आई एम एज द कोऑर्डिनेटर फॉर स्टैंडिंग on one health in iwas rampur here i will since the webinar series on day one competencies for bet graduates today this is the third episode on the topic zoonosis for the day one graduates here we have dr tulsiram gampo as our major resource person for today's webinar and i would like to give a short introduction about dr gampo uh He is a veterinarian, DVM, and epidemiologist from Nepal. After receiving a Fulbright scholarship from the Department of States, he completed an MS degree in clinical epidemiology from the Colorado State University in 2017. With a decade-long experience at the government of Nepal, he is currently working as a veterinary office officer at Central Veterinary Laboratory, Kathmandu. His research interests and publications are related to priority zoonosis. antimicrobial resistance and one health and here we have dr gampo yes sir hello sir hello yeah i can i can hear you okay sir you can start our presentation okay sir okay, okay. uh thank you uh first of all uh, for providing me this opportunity uh to participate in this um, uh kind of workshop and uh, uh though uh, we are connecting virtually uh, i might know some of you i might have met some of you personally anyway uh it will be like uh, i hope it will be nice meeting with with you for next one hour or more so i want to start my presentation Uh, i can i can see some of the uh, participants are still popping up i think uh, uh, we can handle over it okay uh, let me share my screen right now uh, are you seeing my screen right now yes sir this is totally visible okay thank you Let's get started. So, uh, topic for today's presentation is genosis for the day one graduate. As you all are in veterinary schools, and one day you will graduate from that school, and this on the day first of your graduation, what are the prerequisite or what knowledge and skill you have in the genosis? That is the main theme of today's presentation. I think. Okay. uh these are the outline of my presentation first uh, we'll talk about objectives for genosis and uh, that is uh, based on the oie recommendation on the competency of graduating vets day one graduates and i will talk about priority genosis in nepal and it, i will discuss with some examples and i will talk about neglected genosis as well and we will discuss more on the food born genosis and application of modern laboratory tools and i will talk about laboratory networks mainly the government lab network of nepal and we'll talk about strategic intervention for the genetic disease control and we'll end up with some discussion let's get started as day one graduates uh, need some prerequisite and there are some objective of learning and once you are a graduate you should have at least common understanding of common genetic and food borne diseases what are they you should understand that next you should be able to explain the current diagnostic and therapeutic tools that are commonly used in veterinary practice and we need to understand the implication of the genetic disease and genosis how they can be applied we should understand that and more importantly we need to uh, know about the regulatory implication what are the rules laws and policies of nepal government uh, about the genosis so within four learning objective uh, we will be discussing today so genosis i think i don't need to talk about more about the definition because this account, this may come repeatedly 
in your classes as well. I will talk more about the uh, policy and control guidelines. Is a zoonotic disease is a uh, disease shared between animals and people. It's very uh, common definition. So, if you want to learn more about the zoonosis, uh, recently the uh, multi-sectoral collaboration of FAO, OIE, uh, and WSO has published a guide, TGG guide, known as Tripatriate Zoonotic Guide. And it addressed, it tried to address zoonotic disease and antimicrobial resistance at human animal interface. Though today we don't talk about AMR, but it, it provides a snapshot overview of One Health uh, application. So, what are the priority zoonoses on Nepal? Recently, Nepal government have decided uh, to list the priority zoonoses in Nepal, the, where there are a lot of experts from different backgrounds, animal health, human health, food, and environmental got participated and listed out 10 priority genocide in Nepal. And first came the avian influenza that includes genotic and seasonal influenza. Then second comes ravage, and it is also very important disease for Nepal. And third coronavirus that includes SARS-CoV-2 and others uh, genotic virus and comes leptospirosis and comes brucellosis and salmonis is also useful because it is one of the uh, important bacteria for foodborne pathogens and less menace is very important uh, from genetic aspect uh, and medical aspect and genetic tuberculosis also known as bovine tuberculosis is also one of the priority genosis of Nepal. Then comes cystisarcosis and toxoplasmosis. I will describe or um, talk about our measure of this disease today. I think you should remember this uh, priority genus in Nepal because it might be important for your uh, upcoming exams like public service exam and other uh, competitive examination because this is the new, newly updated knowledge. Let's talk about bacterial genosis. We, I want to talk about genetic tuberculosis today. And genetic uh, tuberculosis is also known as bovine tuberculosis. And I opted to choose this uh, topic because I did my master's research mainly with the genetic tuberculosis and bachelor's research mainly with the paratuberculosis. So I feel like I can talk more, uh, a little bit more on it. So I choose this topic. And genetic disease is mainly caused by embolies and is infectious, chronic, progressive diseases mainly causes granulopathy lesions. If you see figure six here on the right, and there is a miller TB lesions in the lungs of cattle. And I got this picture from uh, uh, Dublin University College, Dublin, because I got um, uh, my research uh, with the data from University College, Dublin, Ireland. And for the genetic tuberculosis, uh, we have a primary host as cattle. Uh, cattle is a primary source and transmission mostly by aerosol and in, in some raw milk. And that is a, what are important. And the, the down figure, we have tested the cattle in Nepal uh, when I came back from US and we found some positive uh, cattle as well. So after then, I tried to replicate a study in Nepal uh, when I came back and I published a paper in the One Health and about the tuberculosis, uh, bovine tuberculosis. We try to use one health approach, and that is a risk factor of TB in human and association with cattle TB in Nepal. One health approach, and it it is uh, it uh, is very important in terms of public health imp impact because we found some association of some of the cattle positive cattle, and there is some positive human in the population. You can uh, detail and find the um, uh, detailed paper in the uh, One Health journal, and so. So, so there are some incidents, some prevalence of this genetic uh, TB. So it is very important because it's killing a large number of people, though it's not killing once at a time, but if you add up the figure, that will certainly increase the number. So uh, actually uh, that is a, one of the great burden for the genetic uh, disease control. So to control this, uh, OIE, WHO and FAO, they have launched 
roadmap for generic TV, but uh, generic TV 2017, I think. And they have uh, projected a plan or goal by 2030, they want to uh, in the TV, in human actually. So, so there is a long uh, impending goals are there. So it's now your duty because once you graduate, you will have, will certainly help in supporting this type of uh, goal in the future. Then I come to talk about rabies, is the viral genosis and it endemic uh, globally in more than 150 countries, except in some countries such as Australia and some New Zealand maybe. Uh, approximately around 59,000 people deaths annually. Uh, you can see the picture of uh, that's what are the things scenario. 95% case in Asia and Africa, and uh, a death, a death every nine minutes. Mostly children are victims because they are more likely to play with the dogs. And I have found some publication related here. The dog bites and animal death in Nepal, and these are the most of the dog bites. Though we don't have a sort of comprehensive information on the rabies in Nepal, but we have some government database so that there are, I think dog bite is almost everywhere, though incidence is uh, lower or higher. And if we combine, uh, there is a end of paper by Pont et al. So what we found is that during 14 or four year, uh, the cumulative uh, rabies outbreak in, in rabies in animals and deaths are shown in the figure. If you see the, if you pull the you know, like straight line here, I think around 40, of average on average 40 to 45 deaths in four years so uh, there is a uh, there is a 40 to 45 outbreaks and around maximum 107 like so average around more than 50 deaths animal deaths due to dog bites in nepal so what are the current situation our target I'm again reiterating that I will won't be talking about the etiology and epidemiology more on it, because you are a day graduate, you should learn it. But some of the gaps will be that policy paper and some of the existing documents. So I want to talk more on it. Uh, we have the uh, current scenario. I think uh, Nepal estimate number of human cases per year. If you see Nepal, uh, I think is quite high, 100 to 150. Bhutan, they have less than five, and in Sri Lanka, even less. So, we have still we have a goal by 30, 2030, zero rabies. That is, that is, dog mated rabies, zero by 2030. It is already 2020, 2021. We have around nine years. Within nine years, we have to reduce the incidence of dog mated rabies to zero. And the government has taken the plan, they're going to target. Maybe you all guys need to support support this when you will be in government. And uh, either you will be government or after you graduate, you will be supporting in this goal. So by 2030, we have to eliminate dog you know, mated rabies. It doesn't mean that uh, there may be rabies in some animals, but we have in human deaths by dog mated. Then comes the avian influenza. Even influenza is also one of the very important diseases, as I have seen shown you that in the East Coms number one in the Friday Genosis. And we have National Contingency Plan for Prevention and Control of Even Influenza in Nepal. These are the plans. Because once you need to apply to this control strategy, you always need a legal documents. This legal documents is always necessary. So we have the contingency plan approved in 2003 and some are in revision as well. We have bottle control order 2060 for Nepali and 2007 Eddie. And uh, there is still um, like uh, surveillance uh, going on and National Avian Surveillance Plan was drafted in 2016. And there is active surveillance and passive surveillance taking place where we all, we also, the Central Avian Lab is one of the reference lab for avian influenza in Nepal. So we are also working on active surveillance where we go to field and collect the samples, mostly cloacal samples and tracheal samples from birds, that is from the healthy birds, that is active surveillance. And for the passive surveillance, we receive samples from the disease or dead birds or sick birds. 
And so we are looking over the digit status. This is the one of the thing what we are doing right now. And uh, based on that incidence and prevalence, uh, Nepal government has classified uh, risk districts. And I am showing that uh, low risk district where mostly about the, in the Himalayan at the upper region and medium risks in the mountainous region and high risks in the borderline area. So, but this, uh, this risk uh, district might be uh, updating. I think uh, there might be some updates over it. The number has reduced, I think. However, Kathmandu uh, capital being the capital is a risk district, uh, risk area because from every part of Nepal, there is the birds come here because there is a large number of birds consumption happens in Kathmandu. So this is the snapshot of the surveillance of even in Kanja. Though I have only talked about the, some of the priority zoonosis, still there are some neglected zoonosis, like brucellosis. Uh, there is incidence of brucellosis in Nepal, even in human and cattle or animals. It's still it's a kind of neglected, though it has been already now in the listed and priority zoonosis. We need to take care of that. And mostly the, the people of the poor, um, the low middle income countries, the burden of genetic uh, is very, very high because if you see in the dots here, the livestock keepers are at risk because where there is a risk, where there is a livestock, there is a risk for genetic diseases. Like if you talk about anthrax, there we get some sporadic outbreak. We have encountered some cases in CBLS also. I personally happen to see that. And toxoplasmosis, we have also uh, doing some surveillance like sero, sero monitoring for toxoplasmosis. Leptospirosis also, we have some study done. So these are anyway, this, uh, this neglected disease genosis uh, is not limited to this, but there are some others as well. Yes, there is, a, as I mentioned that it though is uh, like still kind of neglected. Uh, we have got incidence of uh, uh, genetic diseases in animals and humans. Uh, some of them have found the brucellosis in yak, uh, brucellosis uh, in uh, and they found even association of the human infection as well. And we have also the, uh, published a paper uh, in the BMC where we found some uh, incidence and prevalence of brucellosis in sheep and goat population in southwestern Nepal and uh, and so and we found that there is a higher incidence of bovine uh, sorry uh, caprine and um, uh, brucellosis in sheep and goat population. So now when we talk about viral genosis and bacterial genosis, we will be still missing the another part that is food bond genosis. I think foodborne genosis is not much got importance in Nepal. I got through some literature and but, but I found very limited uh, information on it. But when I was uh, studying in masters in US, we got a lot of uh, study about the foodborne genosis and a lot of case studies, uh, foodborne genosis. I will talk, I will want to show the, some of the uh, things how they do and how we are here in Nepal. Uh, common foodborne genosis in US, I think norovirus, I think this may be very new terminology for, for you, norovirus. And then Salmonella, Clostridium, Campylobacter, Staphylococcus. These are the common foodborne in fat in US. In the world, I think Staph aureus, Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli. We are, um, as I'm also working in the Central Veterinary Laboratory and Microbiology Unit, uh, we encountered certain numbers of the um, bacteria, mostly E. coli, Salmonella from the food animals like poultry, birds, and some other things, they are uh, risks for uh, uh, foodborne pathogens, but there has been little bit information. So what are the things that um, they have applied? I won't talk about that. In the US, I think they have foodborne surveillance. I won't, I'm talking about this because that might be useful for you. If you look about the uh, reference, you can get it. And they have food, a very good net, that's a food net that, that connects active laboratory surveillance for a whole around more than 600 clinical laboratories so that they will submit samples and they will uh, get some information on that. Also, they have also for, uh, Pulse Net International and Pulse Net International is for all. And mm -hmm. there is Pulse Net US also. 
this is a good net, uh, national laboratory network that connects food bondliness cause to detect outbreaks. I think that is not much here. And what they use is they use the kind of false field gel electro electrophoresis and they did uh, one of the modern next generation sequencing that is whole genome sequencing. I think some of you heard about that, but this might be new for you. I have not heard about when I was in graduate, but when I went there and I got it to know. And recently I have taken uh, the courses, uh, uh, training on uh, whole genome sequencing. So that is very, very precise to detect the foodborne outbreaks in the uh, foodborne bacteria. Actually, whole genome sequences, though is a new term, but uh, I really want to show you very simply. You'll get the samples, you do the culture of the bacteria, that is what we do regularly. And you got DNA extraction, that means you'll extract the DNA. Once the DNA we have, you'll do some amplification, amplification of DNA, you make, make, make a, some library preparation, what we call, and then we could send it to sequencer machines and it will do, do, uh, does a lot of uh, production of reads. That is, they produce a lot of uh, the base pairs and we can compare the base pairs pair of our sample with the database because there is already so much information in the database in general that like what we call NCBI database. There are a sort of information about the foodborne pathogens when we can compare and if that comes very close together, then we say, oh, this is very related to this. So for example, E. coli of this strain is matched with this strain. So outbreak might have come from this place. So this kind is very precise and this is very uh, popular being right now. So I'm, I'm going to talk about, I talk it today. So Pulse Net International Lab Network. Uh, Pulse Net International, I have said that this is a laboratory network where if something detects one lab, other labs also can get the information connected. There is an exchange of information and if something pop up and there will be some alerts will be go there and they, that, that is from Pulse and International Labor Network. So this is also very important. I think uh, I can't see Nepal too much, but other countries around this America, European countries are, have this kind of Pulse and International and to report the football outbreaks. In the meantime, I want to talk about the animal laboratory network in Nepal. Because I will shown here that there is a Pulse-Net International where they exchange like information because there is here when you submit the sample on information message, then you can detect the outbreak that this outbreak is similar to something from other place. Like for example, if you take the COVID example, like they are talking variant, right? Like they can by all gene sequencing, if they have a certain base, base information uh, network and they, they can match it. So this is very closely, so they can lead. this is this very, this, this very kind of like that. So uh, there is much of the progress happens in food and you know, food borne disease in, in other countries. But I think uh, in my experience, I don't know, you might know more about but there is not much experience um, information of food bond diseases. So food bond genosis is also very, very important. And as I mentioned that this is a laboratory network on Animal Health Nepal. We have the central veterinary laboratory where current I'm working is the reference lab for antimicrobial resistance, avian influenza, and it's, it's the reference lab for animal diseases. And then comes the uh, veterinary labs at region. We have around five laboratories in the region. We have seven states now. The government is planning to have seven labs in the states. Initially, it was five uh, province, so it was only five. So, and we have one national avian disease lab. It is located in Chiton, the central uh, Nepal. So that is mostly for the avian diseases. And we have BSDRL, Veterinary Standard Drug Residue Laboratory, that uh, talks about drugs and regulation. And it is also located in Kathmandu. And we have TIRES and FMD network. Though uh, it doesn't, may, it may not be part of a uh, genosis, um, it may or may not be, but uh, it, it takes care of the transboundary animal diseases and, and mostly the food and mammal diseases that is endemic in Nepal. So we have that network and we have NBPL, Nep Nep National Vaccine Production Laboratory, and it produces the animal vaccines. And we have, we have been producing 
uh, vaccines for a long time and uh, we have uh, been producing a bunch of animal vaccines in Nepal. So these are the mostly animal health lab network. However, we have some uh, like uh, other labs like livestock quality control lab that takes care of the feed quality and other things. So mostly these are the lab involved in animal health network. However, uh, I could not find such a food uh, like net network. There should be some collaboration with animal health network and some food one lab, net, uh, food labs to get exchange of idea. I think it will happen progressively. I think there is a plan to go move ahead. So how to strengthen and so uh, always there comes about the intervention because there is a problem. Yes, we know that we are still dealing with brucellosis. We are still fighting with the rabies. So we are still fighting with genetic TB. It means some of the diseases, some of these diseases are not, are not, not there in the first world because they have already eradicated. Because still we are fighting, so we are uh, spending a lot of uh, our resources here. So government has proposed that by 2030, we have to eliminate the human deaths by dog bites. That is another thing. And we have in the TB by 2030. And we have also other st strategic um, planning that other than genetic, like we have PPR control strategy and FMD uh, control strategy are on the pipeline. So, so there should be certain strategic in intervention that government has taken the place. And when you guys, when you graduate and you will join in the network or professional network and you will need to support to receive the goal and you should at least know what the government policy plans and policy what how they are doing how the research aspect are there how the diagnostic aspect are there how the document is supporting so that's the thing so i think the surveillance should be strengthened as i mentioned mentioned that the surveillance should be strong because surveillance is a very very powerful tool to generate evidence of something that generates data so a good lab net should be built i think and the diagnosis uh, for the diagnosis diseases and genetic disease the strengthening capacity to be enhanced. Like there is modern tools like application of the PCR and more modern that is application of next generation sequencing also known as whole genome sequencing should be placed so that we have very precise information and we have precise idea. <coughs> Excuse. Next comes the reporting. Uh, we, I think uh, when I started my job in 2010, uh, I think, or is it 11 years, 2010, uh, we have very good, we had a good lab network, like reporting network, I would say not lab only, reporting network. We had some local levels that were uh, generating some epidemiological information. They are sending to district and from district, they are coming to a lab and from lab, they are going to department of livestock and something they have a chain and comes this ultimately goes to ministry and goes to OIS. So there is a good cycle. But recently with the uh, uh, changes in the structure, like three tire government we have right now, uh, what we feel is right now is that there is not much communication about the information from the for local level to the regional level and to the and central level because we are in the central level sometimes if we need to get information in the local level there might we are facing some problem so at least you guys should know that uh, how could we can address that once some of my guys you might work in local government in future some will might work in central some and some will be regional so there is a, by law though the government have their own independence by law they have they have to their mandatory reporting of the epidemiological information or data to the central government and to the OIE. And there are some of the disease that is by law or mandatory report. For example, the rabies is added uh, as one of the notifiable disease that need to be reported within 24 hours uh, if we detect. For example, even influenza is a notifiable disease for a long time. We are rep reporting in OIE. I think you, even you go to OIE database, you can find that the uh, event influenza reporting, highly pathogenic influenza reports, reports from maybe 2009 and 10, uh, where the first outbreak happens. So there is a timely reporting should be there. And 
one the thing is uh, like it has been now being built up that multi-sectoral approach and one health approach is very key uh, because uh, there should be now only stand alone policy may not work there should be some collaborative such like animal health human health and some environmental should come together because at genosis is such a complex mechanism because there will be involvement in environment animals and human so if multi-sectoral comes to fight uh, against the disease they, then certainly they can beat these uh, common diseases so uh, actually we are having some of the multi-sectoral uh, analab approach uh, i can say this i think with the multi sectoral approach, they have listed out this 10 priority genosis that is one of the achievements for right now. And this one health approach is mostly being used in antimicrobial resistance. Uh, I'm also currently uh, leading the active surveillance for AM, um, AM antimicrobial resistance in CBL. So in what I realized that now, now human health and veterans uh, uh, like come together, environment people, they start talking about it. So this is a good initiation, I think. I think when you will graduate and when you are in, in professional life, you will experience more on it. And this is also one of the things you need to uh, know, I think. Yeah, so there is so many information, but some of the key messages that I want to talk about is actually zoonosis disease control would be, uh, prevention would be a challenging job because we are still fighting for it. Uh, against it, we are just strengthening our labs, we are strengthening our surveillance, we are developing our control plans and strategies to eliminate, so it's challenging. And I think uh, when you graduate, you should support us, uh, support the government and support the national plan for the uh, prevention and control of genesis. So you should have at least big picture in mind, how we can handle it. You have to have a picture of global, regional and in-country uh, information. <coughs> and it is now mandatory because we need to know at least policy documents because once you don't have any contingency plans, action plans, surveillance plans, you cannot act on the genosis or you cannot work on it because now there is still challenge to work within three tier governments. So there should be some policy, policy documents already in, in place some are being built. So you, you should learn about this contingency plan. Some of them are available on the internet. Some can be available by publication in a hard, hard paper. So you can get that access and that is useful for you. So I think uh, I remember maybe three or uh, two months back, I went to Rampur College uh, where I graduated in 2008. And I met some of the press uh, veterans. Uh, so we went there uh, to take uh, to, to to give some message that we are doing the same similar kind of job. Like we have certain goals, like we to achieve. So we are uh, went there to just like uh, support or to initiate the um, the graduates that what the government uh, we are doing that. So I remember I had presented there with AMR. And uh, some of my uh, colleagues presented about the rabies and FMD. So, so do we have certain goals to eliminate achieved by 2030? So 2030 is very important for us. And, and probably you guys will join and we will can beat this um, by 2030. And 2030, we have to end the TV and we have to end the rabies and we have to fight for the FMD. We have still a FMD disease and we have still PPR to, to control. So you should also learn this. And now you have to increase understanding of understanding of genosis. What genosis? Not just like sitting in a box, you should get out of the box to understand the global scenario, regional scenario, country scenario of the genosis. For that, you need to always need to get your knowledge. But now, just only not knowledge, you always should gain skill. If you have a skill, you need to hone it and you have to be more competent such that you, on the day first, you see, you can proudly say that I'm the day one competent graduate. So it, uh, it's becoming more challenging and you have to work hard on it. So this is the message uh, that I want to uh, give this 
by lecture by this lecture and personally also if you need some information you can contact me and so but there is always a, a few important messages to control the genetic diseases i would suggest some of the readings and i think you guys have heard about global alliance for rabies controls garc and they have they have a good alliance and they are controlling uh, they are supporting the developing countries to uh, reduce or eliminate deaths of rabies and they nepal has also i think uh, last year i think nepal has also did some assessment uh, with the participation of garc and oie so the nepal has like there is the steps step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 strategic elimination like by step by 2021 we have to achieve this by 2022 we have to achieve this by 2023 we have to eliminate the disease so we have a plan gar have that information you can uh, go through it and road map of genetic tv i have all talk about this if you you have if you read this document it also clearly has a certain plans and this will be mostly useful maybe not be useful for your um, academic uh, like life there in college but once you graduate this information is should be very very will be useful i think and uh, these are the reference now uh, that i uh, did for preparing my uh, presentation and i want to actually acknowledge all the researchers over here and i think uh, this uh, is the end of my presentation and uh, thank you and if you have any question in between i am ready to uh, i'm happy to answer on that thank you over to you ibs okay. thank you so much dr gompo for this short but very informative presentation uh, we we are all here for the zoonotic disease prevalent in nepal like zoonotic tuberculosis rabies avian influenza and many more we are very pleased to hear your expertise and all laboratory works on all the subjects sir and for the participants i would like to call all the participants to put your queries in the chat box or you can raise simply your hand virtually and we will allow connecting with dr gampo sir yes yes i can hear you <laughs> thank you so much sir for this presentation we have some uh, queries in the chat box should i recite okay. them for you uh, yes uh, uh, okay uh, go okay, on okay, i will uh, here is the first question from usha khatri she asked sir could you please highlight on elef elephant tuberculosis its prevalence in nepal and any case study done upon it yeah <laughs> thank you is very pertinent question and yes they uh, when i was uh, like though i have not much experience in uh, elephant tv yes elephant tv of nepal is reported everywhere like when i was doing masters then my my advisor was a tv expert and he asked me you have tv in nepal and in elephant so there is it is very common knowledge that we have we have incidence or prevalence of disease or tb disease um Uh, in nepal for the elephant so the, at this date all the people know about that so yeah um, uh, there are some case studies i think they did i think mostly they found that m bovis also i think the m tuberculosis also they have i think found uh, other uh, m microbacterium orgis microbacterium orgis is a cloud, is a part of the microbacterium tuberculosis complex and microbacterium orgis is also very causing the problem uh, in the wildlife so yes uh, there are suggested reading i will suggest some of the uh, uh, readings in elephant uh, there are a lot of cases for uh, reports i have even found the case reports of uh, tv in uh, rhino rhino maybe there is tiger as well so you can work over there yes there is uh, prevalence of tb in elephant thank you okay thank you sir i think she she has got your answers and then question asked has there been any progress in curing rabies after the occurrence of clinical symptoms oh so you are talking about is there any probability of survival survival okay yeah. yes sir yes 
I think uh, the blanket answer is no. Mostly is 100% parallel. But there are a few cases, maybe one or two cases, they survived because they went a lot of or treatment. They got a lot of intensive care. And there are some publications. One or two person have survived because they were given treatment with hyperimmune serum. And only one or two people uh, got to like they able to beat the rabies. Otherwise, it's hundred percent parallel. So for the common knowledge, uh, is less likely uh, there is there is uh, always fatality with the disease. Okay, thank you, sir. Here we have another question too uh, from Pradeep Sarma. How important is listeriosis genetically in Nepal, sir? Thank you. You are talking about listeriosis, yes? Yes. yes Yes, I found a little bit information on listeria. Uh, they said the most of the uh, some of the publications were related to the dairy consumption and they uh, develop literature in human. But there is a little information uh, from Nepal. But it's very important. Mostly, I will talk if you talk about U.S. and other developing con developed countries, is very very important. But to my knowledge as well and uh, the literature, I think there is very less information about the listeriosis. I think um, hopefully um, we need to source and we need to um, get more uh, information on that. Personally, I have also very limited uh, information on the listeriosis. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, that's all, sir. We have in the chat box. <laughs> it's already okay, sir. I found a lot of questions. So I thought there was so many, but already five questions, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Lastly, I would like to say that um, for being with us, even in your busy schedule, we are very glad to have this presentation from you, sir. Yes. And I would like to call Mr. Samin Dahal, President of IBS Rampur, to conclude and end the session, too. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Hello, am, am I audible? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Tulsiram Gambazar, for this wonderful session. I do hope that uh, we have for the future cooperation for such programs and all. And I would like to thank all the presentation for all the um, atten attending personnel for this episode of the series. And, and be sure to join us for the fourth and the final episode uh, which is happening on sunday thank you now i would like to officially in this session thank you so much for providing this opportunity stay safe thank you thank you thank you very much